Well, thank you. Excellent. Good afternoon or good morning, everybody, and welcome to this um, conversation on an interesting book called Subtract. My name is Lawrence Jones, Vice President of International Programs here at the Edison Electric Institute here in Washington, D.C. Um, again, for those of us, those of you joining us, uh, you've been uh, seeing us do these virtual conversations for the past two years. And as you will notice, today is my first day with a different backdrop, and that is because I'm actually in our office today. Uh, and so EI is uh, open for business, and we're gradually sort of uh, coming in into the office. And so if you're not recognizing me, it's because I'm in a whole different space today uh, in the office here at EI. So our guest, again, like I said, it's uh, Professor Lydie Klotz, author of the new book, Subtract, The Untapped Signs of Less. During the conversation, if you have any questions, please put it in the chat. We'll read it. But uh, this should be a very uh, stimulating conversation. So, Lydie, without further ado, let me say welcome to EEI. Thanks, Lawrence. Um, happy to be here and really looking forward to, to talking to everybody. Great. So, first of all, let me congratulate you on the book. Um, in, it, in and of itself, an accomplishment, writing book is not an easy thing, but Tell us a little bit about Subtract. Why did you write the book in the first place? In fact, before we go there, tell us a little bit about Professor Klutz. What's in your bio or what's not in your bio that we should know about you? Tell us something we don't know about you by reading your bio. Oh, don't know about me. Um, I played, uh, I, I lived for soccer for the first 22 years of my life. Uh, how about that? So I, uh, yeah, that was the soccer determined where I went to college and then even played professional soccer for a year after college before I started thinking about how I wanted to um, have a career and affect change in the world. How's that? Ah, didn't know that. So wh who do you play for, by the way? Uh, I played for the Pittsburgh Riverhounds. So they were, they were like one level below major league soccer in, ah. uh, in like the U.S. system. So I was making like $2,000 a month. It wasn't enough to, uh, <laughs> to have a, it was great for a post-college and, you know, uh, for doing something that I love, but it wasn't, yeah. I wasn't, I wasn't Lionel Messi um, or uh, close. So. No, well, we're, we're happy to have you here. We're going to come back. I didn't know that part of your, your, your biography. So we're going to come back for us to understand how much did playing soccer affect uh, you're writing this book, but we can discuss that later on. So let's talk about the book. Why subtract? Tell us how the book came about and 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 how you got on this journey. I mean, the short the short answer for why I write a book is, I mean, it's the most useful thing I've ever discovered in my research, and it's you know it's just something that I had to share more broadly than the scientific community, and so that is um, that's the that's why I write a book. Uh, the um, kind of the epiphany, which also helps illustrate what, what we mean by subtracting came, I was playing Legos with my son and I brought a replica here. So this is, uh, this is what we were doing. We were building a, a bridge and he was three at the time. So these are the Duplo blocks, the big ones. And um, the bridge wasn't level. This was the problem. And I, uh, I turned around behind me to grab a block to add to the shorter column. And by the time I had turned back around, he had removed a block from the longer column to make a level bridge. And, you know, obviously we found that this applies to more than Legos, but that is what we were talking about is that when you try to improve something, whether it's a, a physical situation or whether it's a social situation or whether it's, um, you know, your own mental models, um, the question we had then is, is our first instinct to add? Um, that was kind of our hypothesis. And that's what turned out to be the case that our first thought is, okay, what can we add to make this thing better? Which isn't necessarily a problem. We have all these mental shortcuts and all the different things we do. Um, but then what happens is uh, sometimes we just go with that first instinct and don't even consider this whole other way to make things better. Um, and so that's the, uh, the, the, um, that's the origin story from an intellectual standpoint, I guess. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, so we'll get into some of the sort of, a, I would call it contemporary application of subtract. But yeah. before we do that, what are the three key takeaways you'd like the audience to, to take from this book? Those <laughs> who are going to go out and buy it, if they, they don't have the time to read the whole book, what would be the three key messages you'd like to convey in the book? Yeah, that's great to start with that instead of end with that, because I think that'll help orient people. So good strategy. Um, I think uh, one is that this is harder 
cognitively harder to take away and uh there's just more steps to it in the in the world and we'll, well i'm sure we'll get to some examples of this and later in the conversation but when you to subtract something requires that you have added in the first place right so if you're subtracting in an organization it's actually more work and i think that um just acknowledging that this is a hard thing to do is is really important because it's really easy to conflate less with easy um, and there is a form of less that's easy but what we're talking about is this form of less that requires you to have actually thought more and and done more so that would be one thing that it's not easy a second thing mm -hmm. um is is the need for reminders or cues um so it's not that we can't subtract it's not that i couldn't think of taking away from the legos uh or any of our experimental participants couldn't think of subtracting in all these different ways it's just that it wasn't the first thing that they thought of. And so if we can give ourselves reminders mm -hmm. that subtracting is an option, and that's why I'm so happy to do events like this, because this is a, a reminder for your, for your audience. I think my book is designed as a, as a reminder. Um, and so that we need to put these reminders in place to, um, to be able to, uh, to think of subtraction. That's one of the best ways to, to avoid this oversight. And in addition, uh, um, yeah, so the, so that's, it's hard, use reminders. And the last one is it's fun. Uh, it's sometimes it, there's this negative connotation around subtracting, but I think as designers and problem solvers, which, you know, I use a very broad notion of design, which is anybody who's trying to change something from how it is to how they want it to be. Mm -hmm. That's anybody who's tuned into this, this fits into that category. As designers, taking away can be a really fun way to make change. So that would be a, a third takeaway that I hope we can instill with our examples. Mm, interesting. So one of the things I found fascinating by the book is reading about the biological nature of subtract as opposed to addition. Talk about that. I mean, why, why do we seem to be instinctively um, sort of uh, inclined to add as opposed to subtract? Tell us about the historical connections between us and biology. Yeah, I mean, so once we had this finding that, okay, our first thought is to add things, then you start thinking, okay, well, why is this the case? And that, you know, so the second chapter in the book goes into what might be some evolutionary reasons for this. And your mind might immediately jump to, okay, well, acquiring food or accumulating things has been a good adaptive behavior over time because if you stockpile food you're more likely to make it through a time of scarcity and and therefore pass on your genes um so that's one biological thing the more surprising biological one uh was this notion of competence um and i, I wasn't surprised that competence played a role in our desire to add so this is you know we, we want to show that we can make an impact on the world but i was surprised that just how how that's an evolutionary uh, advantageous behavior. And so an example that I use in the book is the bowerbirds, they build these ceremonial nests, right? And the, the male bowerbirds build the fancy nest, the female bowerbirds go and look at the nest, decide which male to mate with based on the nest. And then the female bowerbirds go and build their very own nest to shelter the young. So the whole point of the male's nest is just to show that this bowerbird can effectively interact with the world, which is a desirable trait that you would want to have in your genes. Um, and so when we have this desire to display competence, which I think is, if I look at my own struggles to subtract, oftentimes, you know, it's, oh, do I really want to get rid of a thousand words out of this piece of writing? Or do I want to, um, you know, my students will learn better if I take away this lesson, but it's going to look like I, I didn't prepare, that I didn't, uh, that I didn't do the work. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm battling that desire to, to, show, to show competence, which is harder to do through adding than it is, or through subtracting than it is through adding, because adding leaves very visible evidence of your competence. Mm -hmm. um, and this is uh, something that's been studied, you know, biologically in the physical world, but also extended to task completion. Um, and it's a really robust finding from, from psychology. Um, I will say the, the hopeful thing on competence is it's not that you can't show competence through subtracting, it's just that you have to subtract more. So if you think of some of the uh, really radically simplified things, I mean, the iPhone is a cliche example, but it's a good example. I mean, the, the, the thing that's noticeable about the iPhone is the lack of, you know, 
gadgetry on the phone itself. And, um, and so that in that case, there's so much subtraction that that becomes noticeable and is a way of displaying competence. So I think as you're trying to figure out, oh, how can I show competence through subtractions that are better? You think, okay, can I persist to subtract enough so that it's actually noticeable? Mm. So interesting. So, so we have this sort of evolutionary DNA biological inclination to add, but then in the book, you also talk about the the sort of uh, you, the chapter where you talk about temple, you know, the temple and the city, where you get into yeah. this idea of 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 the, the desire to just add on, and then you make the contrast between civilization bringing about the need to add or addition. In fact, what generated civilization? Let's talk about that because I think it will bring us into where we are today as a modern society. Yeah, uh, I I love talking about it, and that um. So if you think about like reasons for behavior, you start with evolutionary, not start with, but evolutionary reasons. And then also think about like cultural reasons and cultural evolution kind of works the same way as biological evolution. It's like, but it works a lot faster um, because the, you know, as soon as an idea can spread, then cultural evolution can happen. But um, if you look at the history of civilization, there's of course, um, these big temples and pyramids in these early civilizations. And it's the, the thinking was, okay, for a civilization to exist, you have to have those big structures. And I'm a civil engineer by training. That was what I did in college in addition to playing soccer. So, I, I mean, I love big structures, but I was really surprised that like these cultural historians and anthropologists talking about this role that monumental architecture plays in the beginnings of civilization. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's one of the things that had to be there along with language and, um, and, and rel organized religion, for example, uh, for civilizations to start. And the one theory, okay, so you think, okay, the, you know, this early civilization gets a, some slack extra resources and they decide to put some of it into a big monument that is a way to, you know, kind of bring people together and inspire awe. Um, which is is one way that it works. But another way that it worked was these huge structures and, you know, building these big things was what got the civilizations to come together in the first place. So if you think about, okay, there's a roaming band of hunter gatherers and they decide, well, we want to have this, um, this temple. And um, the one I talk about in the book is Pop Belly Hill in, in Turkey. And there's these huge stones that are basically as big as giraffes. And so a, a, ga a gang of 25 people can't move it. So to, to, um, to do that work, you've got to coordinate with other people. And then you've also got to think about, okay, we've got to stay here for a while if we're going to build this huge temple. So how do we stop hunter gathering and start using agriculture? Um, and I know this isn't the way that it happened in every single civilization, but there's no argument that this building big things was there at the genesis of all civilizations. And you also see this kind of adding in other ways where it's, you know, adding material things. Um, people started when you're living in larger groups, you've got to have, uh, you know, different types of clothing helps distinguish between the groups and helps people make these, you know, um, faster assessments of, of other people. Uh, so the adding started and then just on a very logical level, if you're trying to improve civilization and there's nothing there, it's long made better sense to add, right? So you're working in electricity. If, if, if a place doesn't have electricity, it makes sense to add it, right? On the subtracting from the grid only makes sense if you've got the grid built already, right? So, um, and if you can think about that with roads and buildings and material stuff. So for a long time, as we we're advancing and building up civilization, adding makes sense, but, um, and that could be another reason why we've kind of evolved to have this decision-making shortcut. And some of these opportunities to, to take things away, to make them better are, are relatively new. Mm. So I'm gonna, I'll tell the audience, there's gonna be, uh, ample time to incorporate some of your questions, but also Lydie has agreed to give some tips on how we can begin to rethink how we live so that we can begin to practice the art of subtraction. Uh, but I want you to talk about Pablo Picasso. I, I, I like in the book, you talk about, uh, you know, this 
this uh, idea of him being able to practice elim elimination uh, of the unnecessary. Um, and then you you also then point to the book by uh, by Antoine uh, Saint Exupéry. So talk about these two guys and 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 why we should think about Picasso and his desire to ex to re to subtract as a way of creating a better painting, more or less. And and then the, the quote by uh, Exupéry who talks about you know perfection is achieved not when there is nothing more to add, but when there is nothing left to take away. Let's talk about those two guys and then we'll move into the more contemporary application of the book. Awesome. Yeah. I'm glad you uh, pronounced Exuberi's name before I had to. Thank you. <laughs> um, and, uh, and he's the author of The Little Prince. And so the, um, among other things, but there, so these are the, the reason I like those quotes and the reason I think they're useful for what we're talking about is to show that um, we've been overlooking this for a long time, right? We don't need a counterintuitive quote from a famous designer or famous writer about adding. <laughs> we don't need Picasso to remind us, hey, try to add stuff until your painting looks good. Um, and so you see these quotes throughout history in all different areas. I mean, one of my favorites is Lao Tzu. He talks about um, a quote that's attributed to him is to, to gain wisdom or to gain knowledge, add things every day, to gain wisdom, subtract things every day. And so that's kind of like the mental equivalent of Exuberi and um, Picasso. And so one, this shows that, hey, we've been overlooking this for a long time. And, and th those are forms of reminders, right? The reason those quotes endure is because they're useful. They, they remind us to do something that we might not otherwise have done. And then, you know, the final thing is, of course, these people have created incredibly valuable things for the world. So it's also inspiring and in getting to that third takeaway, right, which this can be fun and, and useful to, to be able to hone this skill. Um, so yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, no, this is interesting. And, and, I, and I definitely recommend The Little Prince to anyone who hasn't read it. It's also a very interesting piece of work to read. So let's get into some sort of a contemporary applications of the book. And I want to start where you talk about more ability and you, you, you call it time, money, and the modern gospel of adding. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about our, our inclination to add and, and how, do we, how do we not misunderstand what you're trying to tell us here? Because you're trying to tell us we need to learn to subtract, but you're not telling us not to add. So talk about, <laughs> talk about how do you balance addition with subtraction in a modern world and, and what why do we need to do it yeah thank you for bringing that up there's uh, and heading off the question of oh well what about this this thing that we shouldn't subtract and if i had to choose one or the other i would choose adding um and i think that the but um but we don't have to choose and i think that these are complementary we need to think of these as complementary approaches to making change you know one way that our brains can can work and i talk about this in the book is that we we position things as opposites and then say, if one is true, then the other is not true. And that's fine. That's a great way to reason if the things are actually opposites. <laughs> but what we're talking about here is are not opposites, they're complements. It's like if, if adding has been good, it should make us think, oh, maybe subtracting could also be an option here. And if subtracting is good, it makes us think, okay, maybe maybe adding is an option here. So definitely thinking about these things as compliments. That's another, it didn't make the top three takeaways, but it's a good, uh, a good tip is um, we need to shift our thinking from add or subtract to add and subtract. So, you know, this cognitive process that we have, right, where you think of adding first, that wouldn't be a problem if you thought of adding and then that immediately brought subtracting to mind. It becomes a problem when you think of adding and then you think that subtracting can't be an option or you don't even think of subtracting. So mm -hmm. switching that mindset is really important. And then, um, th you know, kind of this last philosophical or not philosophical, but the last piece of the behavior puzzle, right, is you've got the biology, you've got the culture, and then you've got like these economic, political, social systems. And, you know, one thing that people will say is, oh, well, this is all because of capitalism. Capitalism is why we add. And, and certainly there are some, um, you know, the, this kind of privileging of growth is, uh, is a contributing factor, but it's relatively new. I mean, if you look at the history of humanity, um, it was really after World War II when, um, when growth became a, a desirable economic indicator um first in the united states but then kind of spread around through the imf and these other organizations 
and it wasn't, you know, this ill intentioned thing. It was just, Hey, this is a, a good indicator, but then it, we've kind of conflated growth with progress. Right. And I think, you know, at least I, my philosophy is that it's great to strive, continuously strive for progress. I mean, who doesn't want to do that? And, but there's, there's, there are multiple ways to make progress. And so how can we kind of decouple these, uh, this, um, decouple progress and growth because there's, you know, you can create happiness without economic growth. And those are the opportunities that um, I think we need to look for. And that kind of brings us to, you know, I wrote the book because it was useful. I thought it could help people, but I also think it's a very important piece to interject in this conversation about sustainability or resilience or, or whatever we're calling it. Right. And, and it's um, that, we can stay within these planetary limits by subtracting by and large right so you know going back to the lego example this is not a uh, not a non-renewable resource but with the subtractive solution to the bridge we've saved a lego right and when you have subtractive solutions to other problems you save other resources so it's a way to make progress when you can when it when it's the right solution it's a way to make progress that doesn't push us up against these kind of planetary boundaries. And I know that's really kind of high level, but it's, um, I think it's an important point um, and one that the people on this, uh, on this conference can appreciate and take and run with in there um, in the, the ways that they make an impact on the world. We will come back to the first three examples in the ch in chapter one in the book, where you talk about the bridge in, in, uh, in San Francisco, and you talk okay. about the men dealing with the situation in South Africa. And there was another example, but you, you made a statement that I want to, to dig a little into. It's, it's this issue of happiness, right? And morability, the gospel of Adam, the, does more make us happy or does less make us happy? Or is there an optimal balance of more and less? Yeah, I think it's different for everybody, right? But I mean, there's certainly tons of research showing that, you know, after a certain amount of income, which is, you know, under $100,000 or around uh, additional income does not correlate with more happiness. Um, you can think about it in terms of physical things too, right? I mean, Lawrence, you and I were talking about this before. It's like the, the amount of accumulation of stuff in our, in our, uh, our living environments doesn't necessarily make us any happier. And, uh, but it's something that we kind of instinctively think, oh, if I had this, you know, extra juicer, I would be happier. And then all of a sudden it's in your kitchen and, and getting in the way. Um, so, but it, I think this also with ideas and information, right? I mean, there's so much information out there now um, that, uh, you know, you can have this tendency to try to, okay, how do I accumulate all of this? And that's also not a path. That's a path to anxiety uh, if, you, if you don't manage it appropriately. So, so yeah, certainly the it's a it's a balance. Um, sometimes subtracting is the is the way to happiness, and uh, definitely just kind of only adding is gonna, in in a lot of cases, bring unhappiness. I mean, the other one is just with food, right? I mean, if you um, that that leads to obesity, and again, this wasn't something that our ancestors had to deal with uh, because there was you know scarcity of food, but it's um, you know the these uh, are these issues these in our modern world um we when we can just only add it does become a problem so uh let's take one question from the audience here uh so it's it's uh, it's uh, uh paul fitzpatrick and 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 i don't see where paul is calling from but he's clearly uh calling from somewhere but his question is can you comment on practical challenges in selling the idea of less for a human interaction perspective in terms of using less implies efficiencies as opposed to using more. Um, uh, and, and I think you were into that, but maybe you just want to say a few words about what, what Patrick is trying to, I mean, Paul is trying to get at here in terms of just talking about the idea of less and, and why we shouldn't be afraid of subtraction. We should actually embrace some subtraction balance with addition. Can you, can you talk about that? Yeah, I think, I mean, well, let me start. I'm not going to be able to give a prescriptive answer for your industry, um, but I, I think the way to think about this, and I talked about it in the book, is, I mean, we can sell 
we're good at selling things, right? I mean, that's uh, marketers are amazing. They've been able to sell things that people don't need, right? And so this is something that people do need. And I do think it's a fair point that you're not always going to be able to just say, oh, this is less, buy it, right? It's mm -hmm. like, you've got to think about how you're describing what they're providing. And I mean, I, you know, shifting from, okay, this is the, um, this is the thing you're going to get to this is the service you're going to get is one way to sell less, right? So this is the classic example of, okay, instead of providing, you know, a certain amount of kilowatt hours to a house, you're going to provide a service of cool or, or warmth. Um, and then you can, then there are all these other ways to provide it that don't require just more electrons. Um, so, so yeah, certainly you've got to be creative in the, in the selling of it. Um, some of the people who sell this in the built environment, um, for example, well, there's a wonderful landscape designer named Kate Orff who, uh, has done some of the, um, basically, uh, what's it called? Like, revealing streams right so the, these streams that go underneath cities that have been covered up by concrete and are pr not providing the services they used the ecosystem services that they used to i mean she doesn't describe her work as cutting concrete or subtracting concrete she describes it as revealing streams um and so i know that's a simple example but again just thinking about the the language that you use and really framing it in terms of what the benefit is for the human um and and since i since we're talking about humans, I'll just add the point that a lot of the times here, what you're, that is the value proposition, right? Is that the, you're, um, you're providing less of a physical thing, but you're providing a better human experience for the human. So that's, you know, one thing to, to keep in mind and think about how you, um, how you might emphasize that. Mm. So, you know, reading the book is clear that I, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I would, I would, I would guess that the audience for the book was, you know, behavioral scientists, environmentalists, designers. But here is a question that perhaps bring another audience you didn't think about. And there's a question here from, uh, from uh, one of the viewers here, Sandra Bear, and she's asking the question, uh, how can city leaders, and I would expand that to even government leaders, uh, convince citizens to repurpose goods, water services, and, and energy services? And, and what is the best way to communicate the concept of less not being a negative, but actually being a positive. Can you talk about a little bit about the communications to other leaders, city leaders and government leaders that they can incorporate the idea of less in their thinking? Not that less is gonna push back on, on growth or on, on development, but that less is part of the equation. How does one communicate that to, the, to citizens? Okay, I've got two good examples here. I, I think one is uh, Marie Kondo. <laughs> so she, <laughs> well, um, she, a big, a big. My, my daughter's a big fan of her, by the way. So, so I'm okay, sure. Okay, good. Yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> and she's she's sold a lot of less, right? I mean, <laughs> so and and fundamental. So Marie Kondo, if you're among the ten people who haven't heard of her, she's the this decluttering guru, right? And she helps people get rid of all the physical stuff in their houses to make their lives better. And so, but if you look into the details of what Kondo recommends. She doesn't focus on the physical stuff that people are getting rid of. She helps people focus on the end state, right? So like one of the first things that she does is say, okay, envision this room transformed and, you know, clean and you know, however you want it to be in the future. And I think, you know, that's something that you can translate to the, to the city scale is, is, is what's, what's appealing to people is the end state after you've subtracted right um and so if you can uh you can help paint that future vision for them and then say okay well here are the here are the steps to help us get there that is one um one one way that we can learn from condo and some of the other people that have uh that have subtracted or help sell subtraction the other um, example is just, uh, you know, kind of framing it in terms of options, right? And I think that's a lot of times when we subtract from, especially from systems, that's what we're doing. And we're talking about this at a sustainability level, right? So, you know, the definition of sustainability is meeting our needs without ruining the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So how do we leave options for future generations, right? And in a lot of cases, that means kind of cleaning up after ourselves. And so, again, that's... Um, I know that's that one is that one might be politically fraught, uh, but it's a it's um it's a way to kind of not have the focus on the 
the, th the specific things that you're subtracting and have the focus instead be on the what you're leaving afterwards and what's going to be so great about this post subtracted world. Yeah, in the, in the context of sustainability, you and I, I'm glad you brought it up in terms of where you define it. I want to talk about the bridge in San Francisco. Yeah. <laughs> the very first examples. Tell the audience about that, 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 that story, that whole idea that gave you more thought around subtraction. Uh, just talk about it a little bit. Yeah. Um, and so the, the, if people have been to San Francisco, you've probably been to the Embarcadero, which is, right now is this beautiful, it's the walkway along the waterfront and you see the harbor seals and there's a, um, uh, and there's a, uh, uh, like a amusement park there, a bread factory. I mean, it's just, it's one of the most visited destinations in the world. And I went there and I said, oh my gosh, I think this is the place that one of my students was telling me about. And so I looked and sure enough, and my student knew my interest in subtraction. And he, he said, and he had this example of like, there used to be a double decker highway on top of that space. And so when post-World War II, when we're building a lot of highways through cities for military mobility and you know, contributing to suburbia, um, they built a highway, two, two decks on top of the Embarcadero. And, you know, basically since it had been built, the city planners, like the people, like the question we just got, um, were saying, oh, well, maybe this would be better if we, you know, got, got rid of it. You're, it's taking up some really precious waterfront. And I don't think, we don't think that the impacts to traffic would be bad. And, and they studied it and, you know, did all these calculations. And there was a very rational case that, okay, this just is doing more harm than good. Um, but they, the city planners had just given up on trying to make anything happen. I mean, they put it to a vote in the city at one point, I think in the eighties and it two to one got voted down by the city, by the residents. Um, so they said, okay, we'll just move on to other things. But then of course the, the earthquake happened in 1989. This is the, the Bay area during the world series. Um, and a devastating earthquake. I think 63 people died in one of the most costly earthquakes in, in US history. Um, a lot of the deaths happened on a double-decker highway in Oakland that was basically the exact same construction as the Embarcadero. So now you've got, and then the Embarcadero got damaged and shut down this double-decker highway that, um, and so now the calculus has been changed. And so the, it's like, okay, do we want to rebuild this highway, which by the way, looks a lot like this other highway that just got damaged in an earthquake, or do we want to take this opportunity to get rid of it and create this beautiful waterfront? And even then, I mean, it was, the opinion was really split. The planning commission ended up voting six to five to get rid of it. And the mayor passed it through. And then the mayor and that planning commission got swept out of office and right in the next election in part because of getting rid of this and uh and now there's no question there's nobody who thinks that that was a, a bad decision so so it was just really hard this was wasn't a case of people not thinking of it but it was a case of even after you think of subtraction how do you get people to to follow through with it because we are you know it is harder to to lose things than it is to to gain things of the of the same value um and so i i think there's a I'm trying to wrap up the lessons from that story. One thing that I love about that story is that, yes, it was city planners and it does seem like, oh, this is really big uh, infrastructure scale, but <laughs> Sue Bierman was one of the city planners. I mean, she, she didn't have any training in urban planning. So it, it shows that like individuals can make scale, make change at the city scale. And it's also an example, quite frankly, in the most recent infrastructure plan, you're seeing more cities think about, okay, Syracuse, New York, close to where I'm from, for example, Interstate 81 goes right through the middle of that city and bisects, bisects a, what was a thriving Black neighborhood. And um, they've now they're going to get get rid of it. So it's an example of, OK, after we've you know built up a lot of roads, we've got opportunities to, to make things better by getting rid of some of them. And it's also an illustration of how do you kind of how do you sell less, right? Because it's like once people could see what this end state was, um, they became uh, more likely to to buy in. Mm. I, I, let's. I want to talk now, lady, about the idea of scaling up subtraction at a societal level, because uh, I think, given where we are as a world, given where we are, when we talk about sustainable development. Uh, we talk about you know energy consumption. We talk about electrification, which is a big issue to electrify the world. Um, how do we scale up 
on the one hand, or scale up subtraction, but also balance that with the need to also think about addition. So, so it's so so the, the, it's a very tricky proposition here for some because if you look at most of the the, reg, the business models that govern the world today are, are on the premise of addition, right? Mm -hmm. So my two questions to you: one, how do we scale up subtraction as a practice, both at an individual level, but let's stick at the system level first. How do we scale it up? But then also, how do you create value by subtracting? Because I think people need to appreciate that you can actually create value by just removing a little piece of the puzzle. Guess what? You can have a very beautiful painting. So how do you do those two things? Create value by subtraction and scale up subtraction as a practice across society uh, and across business and across government. How, how do we do that? Yeah. Let me, I'm just writing them down so I take them in, in sure. order, but uh, let me first start with a story of scaling up subtraction. And I'm so glad you brought it up at the systems level. And I think that, you know, your audience is thinking at the systems level about this stuff. And there's this beautiful, um, uh, Kurt Lewin, who's the founder of social psychology. He was a, a born in Poland, moved to Germany, had to leave Germany when Hitler came to power. Uh, and then he was in the US. And he was only interested in his motivation for studying social psychology was to be able to make change in the world. And so he would, he was in one of his biggest advances conceptually was to look at behavior as part of a larger system, right? So it's not about just the individual, it's about all these forces that are acting on the individual. And so he was essentially talking about systems and he said that in systems, there are two ways to make change. I mean, and there's one good way and one bad way. And the, the, the bad way is to, to add things to the system. And the, the good way is to subtract things from the system. And I think, I mean, he was being provocative. I think adding again is, is good sometimes. But the reason he said subtracting was the good way is because subtracting is the only one that actually relieves tension in the system. And so um, if you... Uh, I, I'll go to the apartheid example that I used in the beginning of the book, but, you know, when one of the things that really helped bring down apartheid was divestment eventually, right? And, and, um, and divestment was essentially subtracting financial support for the South African government. And, uh, and so that, that relieved the tension in the system, because if you're, if you just send in like freedom fighters to fight against the South African government, they're still going up against all the financial support that you're providing for the South African government. Um, and so you can think about that at, at that kind of scale or, um, let me another even just at a, a little you know my parenting scale right so if i um if i'm parenting my son who likes to watch uh likes to watch tv at dinner on the ipad and if i offer him him an incentive like add something to this behavior system i say okay well if you if you don't watch tv you can have a cookie it might work but i haven't relieved the fundamental tension in the system which is that he wants to watch the ipad and, and so if the cookie incentive doesn't work, he's going to be mad that he can't watch TV and he's going to be mad that he's not getting a cookie. So it's like double, uh, double madness. And the way to relieve tension in that system, I guess, is to hide the iPad or, or you know, kind of make it out of sight. And so that, that he doesn't even think of it in the first place. Um, so anyway, I think we can all think about, you know, relieving tension in these, in these larger systems and subtracting barriers. I mean, you've got that on the um, that's the, one of the four words in the workshop you've got coming up, um, the, the barriers, right? So focusing on the barriers and removing those is a good way to, uh, to scale up subtraction and systems. And then the other, um, you know, how do you, the question was, how do you show value? Right. Um, and I think, oh, you're muted. I think, uh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. And so, I mean, we talked about these grand measures, right? Like gross domestic product and that privileges adding. And also, you know, so one of the things that the UN and other agencies is trying to figure out like gross national happiness and alternative measures, but all of us use different measures for in our lives, right? So we could think about what, what metrics are out there that are actually privileging addition, right? So my field, um, it's really easy to count. Okay, so and so wrote seven papers last year, and if if that's the metric for success for a professor, then 
then everybody's just going to write more papers and that doesn't it might it's definitely not the best way for science to advance uh, so so the metric we need to kind of rethink that and say okay uh you know maybe the metric should be like contributions to knowledge uh independent of papers and then you know you you allow people to subtract some of those kind of useless papers of which i've 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 had a few uh <laughs> and and go to a and allow subtraction to be rewarded so i think it's how do you um how do you do that in the systems that you're a part of how do you reward that and i mean a lot of the people on the call probably supervise employees and I, I, one group that i talked to after i talked to them the uh <laughs> several of the employees just came with stop doings on their annual report so they said, like, in addition to here are my goals for next year, here's the stuff I'm going to stop doing, which is, makes a lot of sense, right? Because if you're going to take on some new thing and you've got some new goals, well, uh, it's not like you've got free time. So where's the time going to come from? What are you going to stop doing? Um, and that's a that's another way where you can kind of incentivize it. It also serves as a reminder. Um, so yeah, that's that's a way to kind of uh, to, to capture the value a little bit more. So we got we got a, we got about fifty minutes left, uh, lady, and I want to get into two issues or two areas that I think the audience will find very interesting. But before okay. I do, let's just um, go back to the uh, the question raised by Douglas Young. I think it's a very interesting one. So Douglas basically says subtraction becomes hard when there is ownership attached and sunken cost. How do you get folks past these emotions or economic realities? And I will expand the question to put it just in, in terms of the expectations people have around losing something, right? Because subtraction is like, I'm losing something, right? And it doesn't have to be that way. So how do, how do you get the emotional aspect of subtraction to be one that people say, it's okay to take things away if I see the value on the other side, right? So can you talk a little bit about that particular aspect Douglas is bringing up, the emotional aspect and the economic realities of subtraction? Yeah. Um, well, I think, so totally true. Uh, and again, this is, you know, Kahneman and Daniel Kahneman, Nobel Prize winning psychologist, one of his classic findings with Tversky is that, you know, loss aversion, right? So people are generally twice as disappointed to lose something as they are to gain something of the same value. Um, it's different from what we're talking about in that, you know, we're talking about subtractions that are actually make things better, right? These aren't sacrifices. These are ways to make things better. But totally can be perceived as losing something. So again, that's it. One way is that same point about like, help them see the end state, right? This end state is going to be better. That helps them not focus on the, um, on the specific subtraction itself. Um, and then there's, uh, oh, the other thing is ownership, right? And so we've, uh, get an editor and, <laughs> This is, a, um, I think it's an apt example, but I think you can think about how to do that in different areas of, uh, so, you know, in, in writing, it's, it's incredibly hard to get rid of stuff that you've, you've written and you've taken ownership and you think is brilliant. And that's why you have this kind of hired gun who's there saying, yeah, that, that's, that's great, Lydie, maybe save it for the next one. Uh, and the, the product is going to be good because they don't have the same amount of uh, kind of invested ownership in this thing. And I think you can, you know, think about assigning a, an editor in your project meetings or um, think about, you know, having people to play that role. Uh, and so that, to help you overcome this desire to this, you know, this ownership that we have over the things that we've made. I'd also just say that that's a really good reason why, um, why we kind of think of adding first. Um, if you're thinking about a system, right, to, un to subtract something from it, you have to understand the whole system. If you're, uh, if you're a conscious person or a nice person, right, you, you're like, okay, I need mm -hmm. to understand how everything works if I'm going to take this double-decker highway out, right? I don't want to screw up the city just to make this one thing better. Um, so it, it requires more understanding to subtract. And it also requires, like, giving the people who came before the benefit of the doubt so you say, oh, well, I don't really understand how this thing works, but whoever put it there must. So who am I to, to take it away? Um, and those are, I mean, those are fair considerations. I do think we should be a little humble before just, you know, getting rid of stuff. Um, 
but um, so that's, I don't have a great solution there other than that's just like, that's a, that's a hard problem. And that is one of the reasons that we, I think, uh, have evolved to think of adding first. Well, thank you, Douglas, for that segue, because my, the two last topics we're going to focus on here, uh, the first one is addition adds to complexity to some extent, right? The more you yep. add, the more things get complex. And you've now talked about that. You subtract things, you need to understand the systems, uh, the system itself, take a systems approach, holistic approach before you start to subtract. I want to talk about one area of our society, of our lives that governs everything we do. And those are the rules and regulations that govern our lives, right? And in the book, you have a very interesting example from the, uh, the, uh, the Obama administration in the context of the addition or subtraction of regulation and policies that govern how we live. And we know that that's something that everyone is concerned about. There are those who say there are too many, there are too few. What's the optimal mix? Tell us about that example and why you think that using the theory of subtraction combined with addition should help us come up with an optimal set of regulation or optimal set of rules to govern every aspect of our lives, whether it's energy <laughs> systems, whether it's social structures, whether it's whatever. Talk about addition subtraction in the context of regulation and policy. Yeah, and this ties back. I love that you asked about the takeaways first. I'm going to make everybody else do this who interviews me because this <laughs> ties back into that takeaway of reminders and what uh, Obama did. He issued an executive order and he sent it out to all the um, the branches that you can send executive orders to. And this executive order essentially said, hey, Hey, agencies, please take a look at your regulations and uh, and see what could be done to make them more effective or less burdensome. So this is almost exactly like the reminders that we gave people in our, our experiments. You can add and you can subtract. And so just by putting that less burdensome in there, I think that executive order is bringing ideas to mind that otherwise wouldn't have been been brought to mind. And then the example I use in the book, and Obama used it in his State of the Union. I think it's, I'm sure it's on YouTube, but he, uh, the uh, one regulation that they got rid of was um, uh, for dairy farmers, like milk that was spilled had to be treated the same way as like oil that was spilled. And it was just, you know, everybody knew that it was just a kind of a mistake and a, a loophole. And, but it, it was costing dairy farmers a lot of money and, and not really um, providing any environmental benefit. And so the, when Obama put that executive order out there and said, okay, remove these things that might be, um, uh, make things less burdensome, that was one of the things that came to the, to the fore and got passed and it saved I mean, billions of dollars by their calculation and didn't, again, didn't have, I'm all for regulation to protect the environment. This didn't have any negative effect on the environment. And then Obama makes a joke about, I guess it was worth crying over spilled milk in, in his state of the <laughs> union. And it didn't, it didn't land well. And you can see yeah. like Obama looks like he's, um, he kind of knows it as he's saying it, but, uh, so that's an example of a reminder. He's saying, okay, look, we can also subtract things. I also like the example because it's a, you know, a democratic administration. And it's, you know, often with their like seen as, okay, more and more and more regulations. And uh, this really should just be a kind of a politically neutral thing, right? It's like, how do we, um, how do we set up the structure of this system to best serve people? And sometimes adding is good. Sometimes subtracting is good. One example I learned about since writing the book and, you know, so we talked about reminders. Another thing to think about is rules. Uh, and I guess from what I understand, I think it was British Columbia, one of the provinces in Canada, they put in a rule where if a, if a legislator brought up a new piece of legislation, they also had to come with two that were already on the books that weren't doing any good anymore that they should get rid of at the same time. So now you've got this, you've set up the system so that it doesn't just grow, that it actually kind of manages itself at a, at a, at a good, good level. And, um, and so that's, that's something that we, I think could, could all learn from. And if you look at the growth of regulations, the growth of regulations is faster than the growth of, um, GDP. It's like, it's the fastest growth that we've had since the, the 1950s. So, uh, so yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunity there to think about adding and subtracting. And again, I'm not anti-regulation. I think one of the, one of the 
one of the points here is that if you, um, but it, it, when you get rid of the useless legislation or useless regulations, you're also kind of uh, heading off criticism that all like, oh, all, all legislation is bad or all regulations are bad. So mm -hmm. I think it's, you know, for people who care about having effective regulations, it, it's kind of our responsibility to think about the ones that aren't effective and, and clean them up so that they can't be criticized. And I think during our conversation, it became clear that sometimes when you're dealing with these complex systems and regulatory systems are complex to some extent, uh, perhaps subtraction can lead to a better result. And in fact, maybe the result you're looking for is because you have things that are connected that should be disconnected, right? So sometimes you need to go into the system, remove like your son did, just remove that little piece of the Lego. Right? <laughs> yeah. and all of a sudden, boom, you have a good system, right? And I yeah. think there's an inclination uh, to sort of uh, to add. Uh, before we wrap up, uh, two other questions here. Uh, I think we should talk a little bit about the inertia that we have as humans that prevents us from moving towards embracing. You talk about the no noticeability of subtraction. How do we notice or maybe just make subtraction something in our DNA? So the next time I'm about to buy a new book, I should say, maybe for every new book I buy, I should get rid of two other books, right? Because I'm yeah. just stacking books in my bookshelf. Now I buy books for a reason because I'm gonna interview people like you. But, yeah. but, but before I buy a new book, I should get rid of the other two books, right? How do we develop that skill to, to apply that to our lives? Yeah, and I would say the book one, I realized uh, one of the facts I came across uh, was that we encounter like 100,000 words a day in our daily lives now. And that's longer than a book. Uh, and I would argue that if you could divert that attention, like we encounter so many useless words in a day. And if, you know, the more that I can divert that to, to books, it's been a valuable, uh, a valuable thing. So, um, so that's a way of thinking of like add and subtract. Um, the, uh, uh, lost it a little bit there. Lost my train of thought a little bit. So say the question one more time. Well, 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 basically, a... ba ba basically wh where we are right now in terms of putting oh, yeah, yeah. practice, right? So, so how, do yeah. we, how do we do that? Yeah. And it's a perfect, I mean, this I think is the best, you know, we don't have research that proves it, but we talked about all these different reasons why things happen and why a behavior evolves. And I think the best explanation for why we might have evolved to think of adding first is that the, there's just more reminders in our environment, right? So you, you think of adding, you're more likely to think of adding first, and then you walk around the world and you can see the building next to you. You can see the window, you can see the car, you can see the electric grid, anything, any good subtractions have disappeared. <laughs> and so there's not these reminders in our world that this is an option for making change. And so like repeat it over and over, you're less likely to think of it, you're less likely to see it, then you get to where we are. Um, so that, you know, the way to interrupt that cycle, I think is to, to think of it more, of course, which is what we're doing here, but also how do we make it more visible, right? Um, and so you know, oftentimes when you subtract something, you, you might need to kind of advertise it differently. Like an addition just shows up as itself, but a subtracting, uh, a good subtraction, you might need to make a sign, you know, say you, say you cleared a park or say the Embarcadero, right? Um, when I walked around that space, I had no idea that a double-decker highway used to be there. And if there was a sign that said, hey, and maybe there was, and I didn't see it, but, you know, if it was more obvious that, hey, this, this beautiful waterfront brought to you by a subtracted double-decker freeway, then mm -hmm. that's a reminder. And um, kind of the same with the regulations, when Obama talks about the eight the billions of dollars of saving from subtracting this regulation um that is a reminder to people that this is a good uh or not a reminder that that's visible evidence of subtracting making the world a better place so interrupting that reinforcing feedback loop either with helping people think of it more but also making it more visible okay uh we have about three minutes and i want to give you three Three, well, four questions in three minutes, but I'm sure you can do it. First, first <laughs> question. Best. First question, Larry. For those listening who are in countries that are developing, they're adding more things, right? They don't have the grid. They need to develop. They don't have all the infrastructure. How should they think about applying subtraction even when you do an addition? Because you need to develop, you need to build up your, your cities, but you need to do it in a way that 
maximizes your resources by thinking, subtract, and add. What tips will you give them? Uh, I mean, again, I'm trying to stay humble here, and I think they know way better than I do what, <laughs> what will work best, but maybe not falling just right into trying to copy every single thing that the United States, for example, has done, right? It's like, okay, we can look at that as an example of a country that has gone through similar steps, but which of these steps don't we need to, to go through? Um, and maybe that says, oh, well, we, you know, that's the, the classic example of skipping landlines and going right to cell phones. Um, it's like, okay, we can, here are steps in the process that we can subtract and still get to the same spot faster. So you can, you can basically, you can urbanize, but, but you can urbanize in a way that, that is not urbanizing uh, uh, just by addition, right? So, so even yeah. though you have a design that says add, you may say, well, let me remove that part of the system because it might be more efficient, right? Yeah, and take out the stuff that's not adding value, right? Take out the stuff that is adding, uh, yeah, th that's not adding value. Okay, good. Uh, other question is about uh, people listening here. Some have kids, some have staff, some have uh, nephews, nieces, some have their own issues around subtraction. How do we get young people to embrace uh, subtraction? Kids, how do we get our kids to become more instinctively leaning towards subtraction instead of asking for more? Telling me, Daddy, I don't need any Christmas present. I'm okay. I have enough stuff already. How do we get? I think uh, if, if your kids are anything like my kids, don't listen to me, and they're only <laughs> three and and seven, but they do mimic me a little bit still. And so I think leading by example is probably the biggest one, right? And 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 again, making it visible, right? So saying, okay, you know, hey, I don't. When they ask you what you want for Christmas, say, oh, like I, I love a. Uh, I love it. One of those drawings you make, that's the most priceless thing for me. I don't, I really get the most joy out of the, out of that kind of thing, as opposed to a whole bunch more gadgets. Uh, and so that like different ways that we can model how we're, how we're doing it, being good role models, I think is probably the best way um, that I try to do it. And also like letting them keep that beginner's mind. I mean, I, I we don't have any of it. Ezra is not a good subtractor. That's my son's name. He, I mean, he just plays a lot of the Legos. Uh, and that was the time that he stumbled across <laughs> subtraction. But I think that there is, you know, little kids do have a kind of fresh perspective on the world. And we want to, in addition to like setting a good example of using both of these options, adding and subtracting, we want to um, be careful not to just make them think that, that adding is the only way to make things better. And that would be, you know, okay, here's your, um, so they have a problem and you think immediately, okay, what can we buy on Amazon to fix that problem? It's, uh... Yeah, okay, good. Well, two last quick questions. One is personal. Uh, you're a soccer player. Or you used to play soccer. You stopped playing soccer. Uh, tell us about what did playing soccer teach you when you're writing this book in terms of maybe not giving the pass to your, <laughs> your, co your fellow your player, but also more, more seriously, what did you get out of writing this book? How has this book changed your life? I get to talk to people like you in, in this audience. I mean, that's the biggest thing. And I, that's just an incredible learning experience for me, um, both, you know, writing something down and, and going over it and over it and over it and tr getting it just right. I mean, you think you know something and then you write it down and you, you get to a much deeper level of understanding. And then having the tremendous privilege to go talk to all these people who are making real change in the world and get their perspectives and hear their questions. Um, that has been the main way that it's, uh, that it's changed my life. Mm. Well, well, final question, final question, uh, Lady, uh, basically is one along the lines of um, every author I know has a next project. <laughs> so you've just scraped the surface when it comes to subtract. You've got me interested. I think you are now the Marie Kondi, whatever she's called, of, of, of the business world because you're telling us to apply similar concepts from her, from her book or from her teachings to what we apply to business. So what's next? What's the next book going to be about? Uh, I'm not 100% sure. The, the leading candidate, though, you're exactly right. We all, I always have a next project. And this is one that kind of got pushed aside by subtract is just um, kind of how our thoughts turn into things. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of research, you know, in books out there that talk about our, our like what causes our thoughts, right? What, mm -hmm. what are the biological reasons? What, how, why do we behave the way that we do, but also like how to, 
how do our thoughts and then like social structures turn into things? And I know that's, it's obviously it's a, a huge scope, but I think um, there's real interesting intersections between uh, behavioral science and, you know, sociology and then the, the physical world that could be explored and, uh, and provide something of value to people. Well, thank you, lady. Our guest speaker today has been Lady Klutz, the author of Subtract, The Untapped Science of Less. Really enjoy the conversation. You're right down the street from me in Virginia, so I'm looking forward to meeting in person and for us to continue this conversation. And with that, thanks again, Lady, and I will turn over to Alikia, who will uh, tell us how you can get all these uh, webinars and other things we've been doing, uh, we'll be doing in the next couple of uh, weeks going forward. So Alikia, over to you. Thanks, Lady. Thank you, Lawrence.